Hello, 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 mga kameta, mga ka-unity, mga ka-Google Analytics, mga ka-data scientists, mga kaibigan natin, kamusta kayo dyan? I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, ituloy natin po yung ating mga kuda <laughs> uh, ukol doon sa mga bagay-bagay na pinag-usapan natin over the past few days. Medyo balikan ko ulit yung issue ni Lenny, yung kanyang lectures, etc. And my suggestion na sana yung mga lecture series na she will consolidate them into a kind of a digestible book. no? Some nice books, some, some I don't know, memoir or something like that. Para malaman naman natin kung anong mga naging reflections niya doon sa kampanya, anong reflections niya uh, six years under Tatay Digong, uh, being the vice president of the former president, going against the Marcoses. I think there's so much here that we can dig into no and, and try to understand of course so yon eh syempre yung mga ano natin na clickbait na naman yung mga troll friends natin mga ka troll farms kagad oh ang dami nagreact dun sa suggestion ko na magkaroon ng libro siguro si Ma'am Lenny and ayan na naman yung mga troll farms nila light light si Lenny ang tanong may ibubuga ba ang ano, yung ba yung tama, tama ba yung tagalog natin May pang may may pangtapat pa yung amo nyo sa mga academic credentials ng mga Robredos at mga kanyang anak, de ba? At hindi mga mga scholars mga anak niya, hindi lang sa basta-basta ng eskwela, mga best in the world. So, you know, they say you're a good parent if you see your children doing well in life. So, in fairness naman kay Ma'am Lenny, mukhang she's doing well even as a parent, no? Uh, also as a parent, by the way. Uh <laughs> Balikan natin yan. But actually today guys, I wanted to talk about something that hopefully will set the tone dun sa interview namin later with uh, Dr. Lisandro Claudio. So guys, by the way, so mamayang gabi, sorry, because of time zone differences, eh ngayon tulog, uh, tulog pa yata yung mga taga California uh, or yung mga iba dyan na kailangan magtrabaho, magturo sa araw. So later evening guys, kausapin po natin si Leloy Claudio. Uh, Dr. Lisandro Claudio of University of California, Berkeley. Uh, so, nagtuturo po siya sa Department of History and Southeast Asian Studies. But, of course, Lelo Claudio, interestingly, opened up some interesting discussion. At dami interesting. He, I, I want to say, but, sige, later na. He kind of, I want to say opened a can, uh, can of worms, but, um, basta, he, he steered a tempest in a teapot. Doon sa kanyang discussion ukol sa ekonomiya. And, and, and in fact, in light of that, tayo po ay uh, medyo nag-engage din sa debate na yan because I always believe that uh, no one should have a monopoly on public policy discourse. Neither political scientists, not po- nor public administration experts, nor economists. No? Yun po yung point natin ever since. Ito po ay isang bagay na dapat lahat may say. Of course, informed say. All right, informed say, de ba? Uh, hindi naman yung mabara barang say. Eh, so medyo ano? Uh, so nagsulat tayo ng konte about that. So yung, if you look at my column today at, on on the Philippine Daily Inquirer, guys, uh, the topic is the need for Ferdinand Marcos Jr. to have a kind of economic revolution. Ay ay na naman alam ko na yung mga alam ano naman kung ano na comment niyo. Chill lang kayo dyan, ha? Let me explain that to you and and try natin to contextualize it with a much more let's say intellectually substantive way okay okay judgmental jan mga mga kameta mga ka uni team yeah mga ka google analytics mga ka creative communications and ang ang ano naman tayo jan okay so ito po yung article natin today ilabas natin yung mga hindi nagbasa Wala, hindi naman kayo nagbabasa ng mga columns ka. Gusto lang yung mga blogger, mga trashiness. <laughs> Yan ang mga gusto niya. So, ito po ang pag-usapan natin today. Yung article natin sa Philippine Daily Inquirer kung saan... Uy, sino yun? Wow, sino yun? <laughs> Ayan tayo. Sarili ko, ibabarda gulan natin. Ayan, wait lang. Easy natin to. Lagyan natin sarili natin dito. O, oh, ito to. Pag-usapan natin ang sarili natin. Yan, mga trolls, sige, attack niyo ako. Go! Sabi nila, si Darion pinag-usapan ang sarili. Ayan <laughs> naman, para matroll tayo. Sige lang, go lang mga trolls. Ayan, isi-screenshot nila yan. Tapos, atakin tayo ng mga... Ayan! Sabi nila, hey, Darion coding himself. Ayan! 
Hey Darian said about Hey Darian. Ayun to. Yan ang mahirap kasi. Di naman talaga ako vlogger eh. Nakiki-excena lang ako sa vlogging. Pero, so ngayon, binablog ko ang sarili ko. Di ba? Okay yan na. Oh, may future tayo dyan. Pwede <laughs> i-vlog ang sarili natin. Katulad ng sinabi ni Hidarian, ito mga, ano, mga ka-vloggers. Pag-usapan natin si Hidarian. Hindi, hindi, hindi. Ako naman, guys. Ganito kasi. Mga ka-unity, mga ka-Google Analytics. Ganito kasi. Doon sa first hundred days ni Marcus Jr., obvious na obvious na gusto niya talaga i-focus itong issue ng ekonomiya. No, doon sa State of the Nation address niya, doon sa kanyang inauguration speech, doon sa kanyang pagbisita abroad, kumawa daw siya ng $14 billion doon sa visit niya sa Indonesia and Singapore. Wala pang ilang weeks, nakabalik na naman siya sa Singapore. Grand Prix, Grand Prix Diplomacy. Meron daw sa pinag-usapan na business. Wow, talagang kailangan na mag-grand prix ka para mag-usapan ng business, of course. ba? Diba? Eh, ganyan talaga mga ano, ba? Diba? Alam na this, ba? Diba? Um, and then pumunta sa America, dun sa New York Stock Exchange, etc. So, it, it looks like economics is a very core element of at least the first hundred days and first six months of the Marcos Jr. presidency, if not his entire six years term in office. Kasi, of course, si Marcos Jr., I still, I Department of Agriculture Secretary, he had very big promises that he made dun sa issue ng agriculture, dun sa industriya natin. He described the Philippines as the new rising economic star of Asia, you know, yung mga tiger cup economy, etc. So in light of all of that, sabi natin, okay, 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 sige, gusto natin maging the best tayo sa economics, di ba? Tapos expert pa naman si, ano, alam niyo na, si congressman sa... Uh, Global Financial Markets. Ayan, currency Exchange. So in light of that, sabi ko guys, pag-usapan natin mga bagay-bagay. Pag-usapan natin mga bagay-bagay. Including ito si Heydarian. <laughs> Matatroll talaga ako dito. Si screenshot nila yan. Tapos, si Heydarian, pinag-usapan ang sarili. Ayan <laughs> tayo. Sige, screenshot niya. Mga meta. Okay, okay. Now, ganito. Dun sa article na yun guys, pinag ko yung mga dark clouds over the horizon especially for emerging markets like the philippines no uh so if you look at it a lot of experts are saying that kung tuloy-tuloy itong situation sa us federal reserve at strong dollar not only will you have a recession but really big problem for the world no and uh, among people who really really have been focusing on this issue is uh muhammad el aryan uh, a, a leading economist, guys, who really knows what's going on in the financial markets. And he has this, he had this fantastic book recently, not so recently, but one of his recent books was on central banking and monetary policy, which was one of the reference points that I raised on some local economists dito, uh, na siyempre silang dapat talagang tama parate, di ba? So, mga reference lang naman natin yung mga leading global economists, di ba? Uh, <laughs> Ayan <laughs> naman tayo. Hindi, mamaya na tayo magbardagulan. Wait lang ha. Ilabas natin ito si... Uh, para makita niyo guys yung concern dito ng mga maraming tao. At of course, concerned din tayo dyan because we know historically, when very strong in dollar, the impact is gonna be quite hard for a lot of developing countries katulad natin. Diba? So this is the article by top economist Muhammad El Aryan on the relentless appreciation of dollar is terrible news for the world economy. No? Uh, especially mga emerging markets, no? Especially yung mga katulad natin. Dahil nga, guys, pag masyadong malakas, pag masyadong malakas, guys, etong dollar, eh, ang problema dyan, not only mamahal yung mga imports natin, and Philippines is net importing country. But the problem also, guys, mga ating mga kababayan, mga kameta, ka-Google Analytics, no? Mga ka-Unity, isang pang problema kasi dyan, guys, is Marami tayong utang also na de- dollar denominated. Na yung inutang natin na sa dolyares, no? So if dollar appreciates by 20%, that means your debt appreciates by 20%. So habang nagbabayad ka ng yung principal amount, habang nagbabayad ka ng interest, now you also have to take in consideration yung 20% increase or potentially even more dun sa value of dollars, no? So 
the 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 debt the the pressure on the uh, the emerging markets guys is going to be really really high and i think this is something that a lot of people have not been paying enough attention to we talk a lot about yung utang ng pilipinas but we have to also look at that fact that a big chunk of that actually guys is dollar denominated no so yun po yung problema natin so ang laki ng pressure nito kawawa naman yung mga ating mga kababayan or mga mga kompanya dito sa pilipinas na umutang in uh, in dollars para mag back up ng economy nila ng kanilang mga businesses or get back into action so a 5% dollar appreciation is a huge pressure a 20% uh, is really, really out of this world. No? It's going to be very, very difficult and put a lot of them in an in, in ex- existential crisis. Now, so so if, if you want to better understand uh, where this argument is coming from, I also suggest uh, read this very interesting article by uh, article in New York Times on the impact of strong dollar on developing countries. Now, again, I, I feel this is something that we're not paying as much attention to yung utang natin in dollars no so this is going to be a big big pressure sa mga developing countries na inexplain natin dito sa mga kamera natin on YouTube on on Facebook among others all right so yon so yun yung sinasabi natin one second i'm just gonna take it out so so that you guys can check it for yourself para makita niyo yung uh, reference point natin diyan mga kamera yun second lang saan na ayan okay so this is a very interesting article, guys. I really suggest you guys read it. Uh, it's on New York Times. All right. The title is "A Strong Dollar Is Wreaking uh, Wreaking Havoc on Emerging Markets. A Debt Crisis Could Be Next." So low-income countries from Ghana and Pakistan were already struggling during the pandemic. The dollar strength is adding to their woes. Now, thankfully, we're not at the same level as, let's say, Ghana or or let's say Pakistan, for instance, or Sri Lanka, mga ganon. But nonetheless, guys, the pressure is going to be really large dun sa mga umuutang in dollars ng mga Philippine companies, including mga malalaking kompanya uh, na nag, uh, nag-expand abroad, umuutang in dollars, kumuha ng loan in dollars. Uh, they're going to be in a very, very tough position right now. So those are the things we also have to take into consideration, the impact on companies in the Philippines, the impact on dollar-denominated debt of the Philippines. So uh, pinag-usapan natin, of course, yung debt ng Pilipinas under President Duterte. Ayan. The best president! President Duterte! Talagang the best to. Pag alis niya, ang ganda ng economy natin. The best. The best. Naging Singapore na tayo, guys. Daming mga ginawa. Ayan. Ayan tayo dyan. Ayan tayo. So, Speaking of the Philippines, okay, let's be very clear. Not all of the debt of the Philippines is dollar-denominated or foreign debt. Nonetheless, we had a huge bump in our overall debt. So kung even a, just a part of it is dollar-denominated, guys, the impact will be really huge. No, 13 trillion pesos po ang utang uh, iniwan ng dating administration. Of course, kasama rin yan yung utang ng mga dating administrations. Pero ang laki ng dinagdag nung ni tatay na napakagaling talaga mga dolomites mga dolomites natin dyan kamusta naman kayo dyan ayan ang laki laki na nagdagdag na utang natin so when you have a situation like that of ballooning debt and then you have a situation like that of US dollar appreciation ay medyo good luck na talaga sa atin yan diba? so the pressure is gonna be high so this is I think another thing na hindi masyado binibigyan ng attention over the uh, past uh few days na talagang pinag-usapan natin yung itong issue ng ekonomiya no? dito sa Pilipinas. So, I think this is really something that we have to pay more and more attention to. Yung utang under President Duterte, right? Sorry, ang gulo na ito. And the debt crisis no? na meron tayo. So, 13 trillion pesos po yung utang na iniwan ng dating administration. Of oh, course, kasama cumulative from other administrations. And then the dollar is getting strong, so the pressure is going to be very high dun sa mga umutang in dollars. Alright, so this is the concern we have, guys. These are the things that you have to put together, mga unity, mga fanboys, mga sobrang magaling, mga experts, diba? Ayan na, saan yung mga SMNI experts? Paki-explain naman dyan, alright? Of course, they're going to try to downplay this, but the point is, you can do whatever creative communications you want. Kayang gagaw- Sige, mga creative communications kayo ng to the max. Pero, hindi mawawala itong issue na ito. Kasi ito po, katotohanan po ang pinag-usapan dito. 
money doesn't joke, right? You cannot, uh, you know, usapan pera yan, guys, all right? So I think this is something that has not been as much focused. So this is also the criticism I have of my, my good friend Lelo. And I feel I feel like parang he's so uh, gung-ho on emphasizing the importance of, you know, developer manufacturing sector, which I completely agree with. But we're not in that situation because napakahina yung manufacturing sector natin. We're not exporting at, as much. We're net importing country. Tapos lumaki pa yung utang natin. Ang laking utang natin in dollar denominated. And then tumaas pa itong dollars. Ang baba ng uh, pesos, uh, 15 to 20% reduction. Eh, kawawa talaga tayo na to, guys. Ano nang mangyari sa atin dito? Diba? Yan po yung sinasabi natin, mga kameta. Oh, by the way, overall naman, the situation of the Philippines is not too bad, mga kameta. Uh, let, me send, let me show you the projection for the Philippine GDP growth. It's not too bad, but there's going to be an economic slowdown next year, just as we are still yet to completely recover dun sa pandemia, guys. And then, so... Again, the, the situation is not as bad as some of our neighboring countries, as I said, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, I don't know, yung mga iba dyan. But that doesn't mean na kampante lang tayo at sasabihin natin, it's not, the, it's not you, it's me, it's the dollar, it's the peso, yung mga ganyan-ganyan drama. Alright? Ayan tayo. So ito, labas ko guys. Ipakita ko sa inyo yung International Money for, Monetary Fund's projection of GDP growth. Para sa atin, mga kameta, yan. Yun, no? Labas natin ito, mga kameta. Yan. Okay. Para makita niyo naman yung pinagsasabi natin dito. Para naman ma-appreciate niyo yung konteksto ng pinag-usapan natin, guys. So, it's not super bad, but it's not also good, right? So, this is the situation, guys. This is the projection by the International Monetary Fund. Pagdating ng growth rate, Last year, this year, and next year. So if you look at the Philippines, actually we're doing much better than many countries in the region. But remember, we're much poorer than many of our neighbors, and we had far uh, more economic contraction back in 2020 than most of our neighbors, right? Almost all of our neighbors. India lang yata natalan natin. Now, of, and of course Myanmar, because in Myanmar, this is civil war, it's a totally different situation. So the Philippines grew 5.7% last year, this year is going to grow 6.5%. Ang nakatalo lang sa atin this year sa mga ka-level ka natin ay India, Vietnam, and Bangladesh. Right? Yun yung mga nakatalo sa atin so far. Pero next year, guys, our growth rate, instead na mag-accelerate para mag-full recovery in tayo sa pandemic, actually it's going to decelerate to 5%. And a big reason for this downward projection for the Philippines is because yun nga, yung sinasabi ko na mga crisis over the horizon, potentially. Debt crisis, global stagflation, high inflation, low growth in the rich countries who buy our products, who lend to us their money, and also rising import costs. No, So in light of that, bumababa naman yung long-term growth projections for the Philippines. Kaya medyo worrying itong situation na ito. So kaya sinasabi ko, while the Philippines is dealing with these kinds of crises, I think it's also important for us to have some deep thinking about anong gusto natin mangyara sa Pilipinas. Where do, you, where do you want the Philippines to go or to be in the coming years or so? Because over the short run, medyo maging mahirap talaga yung situation ng Pilipinas. So we're really, you know, grasp, you know we're grasping at the straws. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're just trying to survive for now. But there has to be a long-term strategy by President Marcos and this administration to deal with the situation para may improve naman yung kalagayan ng bansa natin and hindi tayo net importing country but actually we can move upwards and that brings me to my discussion today na beyond the whole monetary policy debate no uh, I'm not gonna go into that I think enough has been already said by that uh, and hindi ko na ulit ulitin yan uh, but you know what I've been saying is is mga kameta we need a much more comprehensive understanding of where the Philippines should go pagdating sa ating economic policy no and what I've been saying is that ang kailangan ng Pilipinas talaga, guys, in the coming years, under Marcos and his successors, no? again, for a moment, let's put aside partisanship, let's, let's put aside politics, for a moment lang. No? Kasi, eh, eto na, and dyan na yung presidente na yan. So, tingnan natin ang, anong mga gawa natin ngayon, di ba? Uh, as the clouds of challenges gather over the horizon, economic challenges uh, gather over the horizon. Now, ang sinasabi po natin na isang kailangan natin talaga sa Pilipinas, no? na has been ignored for so long 
kasama pa yung mga dating Marcos time. Oh, it has been a problem for the Philippines perennially, no? Is a successful effort at building domestic infra- infra- manufacturing capacity. Yun talaga po ang medyo kulang ang kapos sa atin, no? This is what Danny Roderick, uh, a Harvard University-based economist, he's Turkish, so, you know, he comes from a perspective of the developing world, of a post-colonial world. Naintindihan na yung situation natin. So, hindi siya katulad ng mga ibang nakakairita ng mga first world academics na medyo unrealistic yung sinasabi. And, ididikit ko yan dun sa sinasabi ni Hajung Chan na sila yung mga bad Samaritans. Ay, or sila yung mga good Samaritans dapat, pero yung advice sila hindi maganda. No, so what Danny Roderick actually has been arguing is very, very simple. Ang sinasabi niya ito is, if you want to create inclusive development meaning maraming tao magkakaroon ng trabaho and relatively well paying job and meron kang economies of scale kasi ang kagandahan sa guys sa manufacturing sector is the more you build the cheaper it becomes right the more parang parang wholesale level and the more you manufacture the more chance you have to move up the value chain ibig sabihin sa una siguro ang ginagawa mo lang dun sa kotse yung tires then, ginagawa mo siguro yung some of the spare parts and dun sa interior. But over time, you can move up and up and make engines, make the computer chips, make all of the more complicated things. And at some point, and this is where China is today, you know, they went from just a global assembly line, now they're creating their own cars. Yung mga Geely na nakita natin sa Pilipinas, out of nowhere, yung electric vehicle industry ng China, the biggest in the world by some accounts, no? China was not there 10, 15 years ago. It got there because the government focused on technology transfers, asking the foreign companies to give their technology to locals. The government provided all sorts of support, good infrastructure, making sure hindi mahal ang electricity, making sure there's a regulatory predictability, hindi masyadong maraming corruption, etc. Para domestic manufacturing ay might grow grow and grow and grow until they reach a point whereby China now can compete with the best. That China can even beat the West, no? So the EV industry of China is now ahead of the West. So let me show that to you. I know everyone, everyone is so on so on Tesla and all of that. But actually, guys, if you look at it, China is now beating guys US pagdating sa electric vehicle industry, no? Because of the aggressive strategy that. Uh, aggressive strategy that their government has had in terms of supporting domestic manufacturing and pushing for technology transfer. So yes, Tesla is creating cars there, but ang sinisigarado ng China is that yung mga Tesla cars na yan, uh, you know, at some point, that will push the local producers to be as competitive. So to set the standard so that the Chinese producers can be can compete with the best in the world. No, My long-term planning, and again, you can say whatever you want about China, etc. I'm no fan of their political system or their bullying in the West Philippines, etc. But guys, they know what, what's industrial planning. They know what's manufacturing planning. No? So, so there are all of these no, of articles I suggest you guys to read on how China is beating the West in electric industry. And again, this has a lot to do with the Chinese manufacturing industrial strategy. No? And this is state-driven. So it's the private sector taking the cue from the government, the government providing all the incentives and benefits. And accordingly, you have a situation where China's my goodness, it's now beating the West in its own game. I mean, if you look at some of the Chinese electric vehicles, like Tesla looks like old compared to them, right? I think Neo Van or something. Ang ganda ng mga ibang cars nila. Like, whoa, next level, guys. So, like, these are like some of the Chinese. Right, let me show you that. And the point, the thing with the Chinese cars is that they're also much cheaper, guys. They're also much, much cheaper and more affordable. And sometimes they're even more high-tech. Yung mga super smart cars sila, di ba? Yung, yung makikita niya internal nila, the best, di ba? So, this is the article, for instance, from CNN International, CNN International Business. And just keep, look, at it, look at the Chinese EV cars, guys. Crazy, crazy. Now, we can have a meta, special meta on electric vehicles, etc. I think it's a very important thing as... It's been getting my attention for quite some time, and I'm just amazed by how far China's gone. So these are the Chinese electric vehicles, right? Chinese to, ah, hindi to Italian. These are not Italian, guys. These are Chinese, I'm showing you. Like, look at them. Oh, la, la. And now in China, for the price of $60,000, 3, 4 million pesos, you can get, like, EVs that, forget about Tesla. They look like Lamborghini, guys. 
right? And they're smart cars, right? Now, of course, we still don't know about the long-term reliability of these cars, but they're getting there, guys. They're getting there. You give them five more years, booyah kasha. So these are Chinese electric vehicle cars, right? I mean, look at that, my goodness. I mean, look at how far China has gone in terms of its electric vehicle industry. And we see same trend line all across major industries in China. You know? We see that in the artificial intelligence sector development, for instance, of uh, cameras, very, very uh, you know, high resolution cameras. We see that in the sector of 5G telecommunications and now moving to 6G telecommunications, like even class of China, China. You know? So we see where China is going. And a lot of that, again, guys, is happening because the Chinese state is backing its private sectors, providing everything that is necessary for them to grow, to compete, to be the best version of themselves, and at the same time, protect them from external competition in ways that allows them to stand on their feet and then compete with the world. So, so wala kang alam sa buhay kung ang gagawin mo is i-liberalize mo yung economy mo nung habang hindi pa handa yung domestic industry mo. Tuloy, tingnan mo yung nangyari sa ating Marikina shoe industry. Diba? Binuksan natin yung Pilipinas, eh, ang kalaban natin yung mga mass producers na dinadump lang sa atin. So, the domestic industry in the Philippines could not compete. So, wala. Kawawa sila. Kaya, syunga ka, kung nagbubukas ka na economy, kung hindi pa handa yung domestic industries mo, you, you first prepare them or you make sure they have resilience before you fully liberalizing. Eh, Pilipinas, go lang tayo ng go. Basta gusto ng world, we liberalize, go tayo. Gusto ng world, protectionist, go tayo. I mean, wala tayong long-term planning. And this has been a big problem. Lack of a strong trade and industrial policy. At yun po yung sinasabi natin. And katulad ng sinabi natin in the previous meta, mga meta, don't listen to some of this nonsense you're hearing from some of these the conventional economists. Look at the works of really, really helpful book, book, books by people like Ha Jung Chan, for instance. Uh, he's a South Korean origin, South Korean born economist based in Cambridge Universities. Uh, he has a number of very, very helpful books on the story of paano naging developed ang Korea. Like from a dirt poor country, uh, a country d dominated by of oligarchs, feudalistic oligarchs. How did it go from that to become a global technological dynamo? So look at his books, Kicking Away the Ladder, or look at his books, The East Asian Development Experience. No? So we see a trend line from China. Actually, China is copying other neighboring countries like Japan in 100 years ago and 50 years ago after the Second World War and before the Second World War after the major restoration and then South Korea in the 60s and 70s under uh, Park Chung-hee, their dictator. So abang yung dictator natin dito, hindi ko alam kung anong mga big global industry ang ginawa niya. Yan ang hindi ko alam eh. Anong ginawa niya? Eh, si Park Chung-hee, he make sure yung mga oligarchs sa kanila magiging Hyundai, LG, Samsung, mga ganon. Now, if you want to understand the big story of that, we can have a meta on that but I'm not gonna force it now. Read yung mga books niya, right? At least one of his books, uh, the, e the East Asian Development Experience, or at least the Kicking Away the Ladder and the Good Samaritans. Those are really, really helpful books. And as I said, see Danny Roderick, the Turkish American economist that I pointed out, uh, who's, who's who's been based in Harvard for quite some time. He also looked at the experience of Turkey and some of the other more successful uh, manufacturing-oriented developing countries. And ang ang so ang sabi niya. Dapat maging creative ka sa economic policies mo. Wag kang makinig dun sa mga new, new classical, new liberal, mga standard economics na yan. Wala tayong mapapala dyan. You have to come up with something more creative that fits dun mga needs ng country mo, your strengths, and also helps you to overcome your weaknesses. Yun po yung mga sinasabi nila na kailangan natin mag-focus talaga dyan, no? So I really suggest you guys, if not read the books, at least read the review of this book so that you see the key points that they're raising because they're very, very helpful. And as always, I said, the, the easiest book to read and understand pagdating sa Asian experience is also How Asia Works, of course, by jo, Joe Stodwell, a Cambridge, trade, uh, Cambridge trained economist and very, very articulate and uh, talented writer and journalist. You know? So I really suggest you guys read these works because they, they will really un make you understand what is needed. We need a Philippine government, guys. We need a Philippine government that provides the basic conditions for the growth of a domestic manufacturing industry. We need a government that encourages and pressures yung mga oligarchs natin dito sa Pilipinas na hindi lang sila hanggang real estate lang, speculative industries, uh, or, or alam mo yung mga low-end manufacturing. No, we have to push our oligarchs 
to get into high-end manufacturing. If there's one interesting case of an oligarch going from making noodles to now making very interesting cars is the case of VinFast in Vietnam, right? I mean, the guy, it, it's just a fascinating story. So these are the VinFast cars. Actually, I have pictures of yours truly in Vietnam the other year I visited Vietnam, uh, checking out these VinFast cars. I mean, and they're gonna go full electric soon. I'm, I mean, forget about China, forget about Korea, forget about Japan, okay? Or Taiwan, medyo napagiwanan tayo, pero tingnan mo naman ang Vietnam, guys. They didn't even have a real manufacturing industry not long ago. They didn't have a car, their own car. And now, this is what Vietnam has, right? Vietnam has its own booming manufacturing industry by VinFast, right? Really, really nice cars. And they're going to go fully electric. They're going to have plants in Germany, in United States. I think the plants are already there, the, the, the production plants. Uh, and and it's, it's built by one of their oligarchs, a guy who used to just make noodles, a Soviet, a Ukraine-Soviet trained uh, apparatchik businessman. And now here we are. This is where Vietnam is, right? I mean, ibang klase, diba? And, and VinFast is gonna go all electric soon, guys, as a glo to become a global automaker. I mean, ibang level talaga, no? Grabe talaga. Incredible. I mean, less than 10 years. Look at where they have gone. Eh, tayo mga oligarchs natin. Ang tagal na nilang mayaman bilyonaryo. Kahit isa sa kanila has not bothered to get into this high-end manufacturing or something real. A real manufacturing sector like this. So, so this is a Financial Times article. It shows that VinFast of Vietnam is going to go all electric in a push to become global automaker. Ibang klase. Ibang klase. <laughs> Ayan, oh. Whew. Of course, ang may-ari ng VinFast is Pham Nat Pong. Okay. Uh, and this guy, check out his background. He was like, wala lang. <laughs> and now, ibang klase. And actually, I think some of our oligarchs here are way richer than him. And yet, diba? oh yeah. See, his net worth is actually $4 billion. Way lower than a number of our own oligarchs and big businessmen who have actually net worth of $10 billion or something close to that, right? So, look at it. This guy, poorer than some of our big businessmen here, but he has pushed that money into really high-end manufacturing. Of course, help from the Vietnamese government was very helpful. So, this is the guy behind VinFast, if I'm not wrong. And look at it. His net worth is just $4 billion compared to like $10 billion or something like that dun sa mga ibang. Uh, right, so this is what I'm saying. If you have a serious government with serious industrial policy, and trade policy, because hindi lang yung manufacturing or industrial policy, eh. dapat sigurado yung mo na protectado din optimally yung domestic industries mo from undue competition or unfair competition abroad, no? Uh, while you're building your so called infant industries, right? So, one scholar has done very good work on that is the Nobel laureate. Uh, 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 Si, si Krugman, yung works on infant industries is really brilliant, and I really suggest you guys uh, to to folk, uh, to check in to check his work. So this is just one reference point for you guys. Maybe you can check this article because it it, it goes deep into this issue. All right. Kasi yun nga eh, ayoko yung, ayoko yung mga blah 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 argument out there. This is a serious stuff. This is, this is something that has to be done systematically, guys. Alright, this has to be done systematically. So this is a very interesting article by uh, Harvard University study. How and when should infant industry be protected, right? And some of the works that have been cited there are actually works by uh, Krugman. Right, among others. Anyway, ang gulo na bigla yung screen natin. Don't worry, mga ano natin dyan, sa YouTube, ma-upload din natin yan with the version ng ano. Ang concern ko kasi hindi ganun kabilis yung internet natin. Baka pagsabay-sabay multi-platform kung saan tayo umabot. Diba? Anyway, so I'm just telling you, pag iwanan ng Pilipinas, ng ibang bansa, not because they're strong, but because we don't, we are weak. <laughs> Wala tayong real industrial policy right isang polisiya kung saan 
talagang tinutulungan ng gobyerno, ninodge ng gobyerno yung mga domestic, manufa- domestic manufacturers, domestic billionaires, right? To put their money into high-end manufacturing so that that can create jobs, high-quality jobs. And as the scale of their production increases, they can create more and more jobs for more people, right? And look at it. The countries that did very well, even during the pandemic period, were countries who were manufacturing driven and export-oriented. That's why Vietnam and Taiwan were able to actually post economic growth during the pandemic, right? And they were able to sustain that growth from last year to this year and next year. Vietnam is having solid growth this year, higher than the Philippines. Next year, they'll do solid. They did solid already in 2021. They did also solid in 2020. Again, one big, it's not even a secret, a big ingredient of their economic success, guys, is yung kanilang focus dun sa kanilang manufacturing sector. At yun ang gusto ko makita kay Pangulo Marcos or any Philippine president in the near future for that matter. I want them to see focusing really on give us a blueprint. Hindi lang yung creative communications, right? Give us a serious blueprint. How how are you going to bring in high quality manufacturing investments of Philippines at the same time pressure our domestic oligarchs, right? Or, or, or businesses to move into these manufacturing industries. Because if a guy with few billion dollars in Vietnam could now be behind a global automotive electric vehicle production uh, brand like VinFast, and this happened very fast, less than a decade, right? Why can't our big businessman with way more money, right? And yung iba, ilang dekada na sila billionaire in dollars, why are they not getting into this? What should the government do to encourage them or nudge them to get into these sectors? Yun po yung sinasabi natin dito po sa mini lecture natin mga ating kameta ka ka unity ka google analytics yeah mga kaibigan natin diyan ka mga ka data scientists friends natin diyan these are the kind of discussions we have to have guys serious discussions on industrial and trade policy again uh, i'm just scratching the surface here there's so much to talk about i don't want to bore you guys uh but i just i just felt i have to give you a kind of a tidbit no of Anong tinutukoy ko dito when I say we have to have a real economic revolution, really focus on what's really necessary for the country, alright? So maraming salamat dito sa mga kameta natin. As always, kay Ma'am Jocelyn Lombero, hope that you enjoy po kayo dyan sa inyong bakasyon. Thank you kay Ma'am Victoria Baltazar. Again, a very supportive kameta kay Steven Santilan, Joselito Madi, Erica Tecochi, Fanny San Miguel, Riz Ani, Maria Esmeralda. Thank you sa mga stars and support ng mga kameta. I hope hindi kayo na-board. Again, as I said, these are not exhaustive. I'm just scratching the surface, right, on this issue, right? I'm just scratching the surface. But that should give you an idea anong gusto natin or dapat pag-usapan natin para sa ikaunlad ng ating bayan. You know, I, I hope comes a day, five years, ten years from now, whereby you can say, my made in Philippines car na tayo, may VinFast version tayo. Because it's doable. It's doable. If China could do it and beat the West, if Vietnam could do it out of nowhere, forget about Korea, Japan, mga yan. Medyo sobrang malayo na sila sa atin. But China, Vietnam, come on, 10, 15 years ago, what were their cars or anything like that? Naalala ko mga 10 years ago, pinagtatawalan yung cherry cars. Ngayon, yung Geely ng China, Geely, Geely cars all over the place dito sa Manila. Diba? So yun, may pag-asa tayo if may plano tayo. May pag-asa kung may plano. At ang tanong ngayon is may plano ba si Marcos Jr.? Beyond, of course, creative communications. So, sana hindi lang presidential advisors on cre- advisor on creative communications na meron tayo. I hope we also have presidential advisor on uh, creative industries and manufacturing creative I- industry trade policy, right? Ma- creative trade and in- uh, cre- creative trade and industry industrial policy presidential advisor. Yun po ang kailangan din natin yun. All right. Maraming salamat ka mga kameta. I know ang dami natin sinabi, Kuda. I appreciate your time and efforts. Have a good day and talk to you guys soon.